Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Android App Arena is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Android App Arena Episode 2 for Friday, June 20th, 2014. Floating Browsers. This episode of Android App Arena is brought to you by lynda.com. Learn what you want, when you want, with access to over 2,400 high-quality online courses. All for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit lynda.com slash arena. That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash arena. Howdy, folks. Welcome back to another episode of Android App Arena. This is the place to go each week for a nice little helping of some of the best apps currently available on the Android platform. I'm Jason Howell, and I've spent a whole week flexing my app muscles to bring you what I hope to be a few new installs to your device. And this week, we're taking a category of apps and pitting a few of them against each other in a segment we call Best of the Best. Now, unlike Chrome, which follows in the footsteps of its desktop personality, a new breed of floating browsers is hitting the Play Store that claim to tackle browsing with a mobile-first approach. Browsing the web on a mobile device is, in fact, very different than working with a desktop or laptop computer. And in the desktop world, multitasking is pretty darn easy, so much so it's pretty much second nature. You open a window, load up a site. While you're waiting for it to load, you hop on over to Photoshop or TweetDeck, and you fill that load time with something else as opposed to staring at a web page waiting for it to load. Yet on mobile, by and large, that's exactly what we do. We click a link, a new window appears, and we stare at the loading web page while we wait for its valuable content to magically appear before our glazing eyes. Well, after last week's inspiring interview with indie developer Chris Lacey and his app Link Bubble. I thought we could spend a little time getting to know this particular category of browsers a little better. Let's say hello to a few browsers that attempt to take a mobile-first approach by popping that web content on top or to the side of the stuff you're already doing. Okay, first up is Javelin Browser. Of the three I'm using today, this is probably the one with the most features. First off, it's the only browser in the bunch that has a standalone full screen version that you can launch right into like you might with Chrome. It's a full featured browser that's highly reliant on gestures for control. Two finger swiping to the side switches tabs. Two finger swiping down gives you a neat image preview of the opening tabs. Uh, two finger swiping up closes the current tab and there's even an edge swipe on either side that we're seeing a lot of in apps right now. Uh, from the right, you'll get access to your intelligent bookmarks that sort based on how often you visit them, and from the left, a number of optional settings and services, like upgrading to Javelin Pro for $2.99 as an in-app purchase. And that actually gives you access to an unlimited number of tabs instead of the cap of 10 in the free version, the ability to customize your homepage, and the developer is even touting early access to the Android Wear version of the app once some nifty wearable devices finally see the light of day. Web browsing on your watch, uh, if you can believe it. Another service called Spirit Mode runs $1.99 per month with the first month currently free, and this actually brings VPN into the Javelin experience, promising safer, more private browsing. But that VPN doesn't extend outside the app, so do keep that in mind. Another differentiator is Javelin's built-in ad block, which can be a touchy subject, so the weight of this feature rests solely on how you feel about using ad block online, and it doesn't require root, which is commonly uh, a requirement of ad block on Android. Javelin has a reading mode that pulls the information from a page and reformats it into an easy on the eyes text only format that brings the content front and center. Very cool. And finally, there's an incognito mode for you private shoppers out there. But of course, the big reason we're showcasing it today is a feature called Javelin Stack. This is how Javelin pops its browser over the top of the apps that you're clicking links in. Whatever app you're using, if you click a link, that page will load in a little Javelin bubble off to the side of the screen so you can continue using the app while it loads. Tap the bubble and the browser expands with on-screen controls that allow you to minimize back to the bubble. You can switch between open links if you have more than one open, or you can send it to the full screen Javelin browser. And I really appreciate that multiple tabs all end up inside one single bubble. It's easy on the eyes. 
And that's Javelin Browser. Overall, a well-designed app, both operationally and visually, and a very capable browser replacement with a preloading bubble feature thrown in for good measure. And next up, we have Linkbubble, a more lightweight floating browser by comparison. Unlike Javelin, there is no full screen component, so you can't simply launch into Linkbubble browser and type a URL, for example. Linkbubble's sole purpose is loading clicked links in the background while you continue using your apps. You can collect an unlimited number of tabs within one single bubble, and switching between open tabs is as easy as tapping the fave icon. One thing I love about Linkbubble is it's easy to use sharing implementation. It's actually a feature that I use all the time. When you hold on a particular tab, you're presented with a few on-screen targets. The left and right targets can be programmed to share with whatever you like, given that that app accepts share intentions. I have my left bubble set for Pocket, which makes production of this show and All About Android incredibly easy. I just drop the link of the page that I'm viewing onto the Pocket, let go, and then move on with my day. Super cool. I have my right button set for the Share menu in case I want to share with any other app on my device. And of course, down below is a big fat X that basically gets rid of that tab entirely. Linkbubble also maintains a history of your links that are stored on the device. So if you dismiss a tab, and need to revisit that link later, it's as easy as launching the Linkbubble app from its icon and selecting history. See, there you are. Oh, and the app does you a solid by telling you just how much time you've saved by opening up your links in the background while you browse. Now, since Linkbubble isn't a standalone browser, you are given the option to open any link inside Google Chrome. And I've noticed that this can sometimes be useful for different reasons. I've encountered a couple of cases where downloading a file wouldn't happen in Linkbubble for whatever reason, but sending the page to Chrome did the trick. But again, not every case was like this, so your mileage may vary. It has an incognito mode as well as an option to expand the browser once the page is fully loaded. It wisely detects if a link you're clicking is associated with an app installed on your device and actually passes that request to the app instead of loading the web version. All in all, I really appreciate Linkbubble's simplicity in its approach. Now, some have scoffed at the price tag on this app at $4.99. It's not the kind of purchase that you fire off without flinching. Thankfully, though, there's a free version that allows you to test it out though you are limited to one single tab in that version. Uh, but again, consider the time you'll save by not staring at a loading page, and that $4.99 might just be worth it to you. It has been for me. And finally, we have Hover Browser. Now, this is the only one of the three without a free component, but for $0.99, cents, it's actually very reasonable, especially when you consider the feature set. Hover Browser is kind of a combination of Linkbubble and Javelin Browser, and that clicking the icon on your home screen or dock will in fact launch an instance of the browser, but it's not a full screen browser, at least not by default. You can expand it to be by clicking these arrows, but by default, it's always hovering over the top of your home screen or apps. You can resize this floating browser, and it does an okay job scaling the page to fit the window, though I did experience some wonkiness when doing that on some pages. You can reposition the browser anywhere on your screen, and there's this eye icon. I'll, I'll be frank, it was more confusing than helpful. It, it folds your current page to the side and lets you see what's behind it, but it still renders the contents behind it somewhat difficult, if not impossible, to actually control. So it seems to simply be a way of temporarily examining the things that are hidden when Hover is showing a page in its normal state. Something else that Hover does differently from the other two here is that it opens each link inside of its own bubble to the side. So open 10 links, you'll see 10 floating bubbles, which could easily get a bit too busy and obscure too much as a result. It would be nice to have the option to collapse them into a single bubble just to save on screen real estate. Hover Browser has a theme option that lets you switch between red, blue, and purple. It also has bookmarks with the ability to import from other browsers, an incognito mode, and an assignable way to send any page into a different installed browser on your device. All in all, particularly on the phone, the browser content felt just a little too constrained inside that resizable window. Hover is definitely a bit better when run on a larger screen tablet, so if you plan on using one of these on your tablet of choice, Hover becomes a bit more appealing. All right, now comes the hard part. How on earth do we pick a single winner here? After walking through all three of these apps, I have to say that they all have incredible strengths and a few weaknesses. Javelin Browser takes the everything and the kitchen sink approach. Linkbubble keeps things simple. And Hover Browser really splits the difference and comes in at a lower price as well. Well, if I had to pick my favorite app out of these three, one app that I'd keep installed on my device going forward, it would probably have to be 
link bubble. What can I say? I appreciate its simplicity and its incredibly intuitive sharing feature is one of its standout features, in my opinion. And Linkbubble gives me the benefits of this kind of floating browser technology uh, functionality without expecting me to live my life inside its browser. It gets in, does the job, then it gets out of the way. And since I tend to live the majority of my mobile browsing life in Chrome, this works perfectly for me. Now, you know what they say about opinions, right? Exactly. They say, dude, you should totally email your opinion to arena at twit.tv. Tell me why I'm right or wrong. No, seriously, I want to hear from you. All right, before we move on, let's thank the sponsor of today's episode. This episode of Android App Arena is brought to you by lynda.com. lynda.com helps you learn and keep up to date with your software, pick up brand new skills, or explore new hobbies with their easy to follow video tutorials. Whether you want to build your own Android app in Java, learn how to use the Android API to create engaging mobile apps, or just improve your programming language skills, lynda.com offers thousands of courses on a variety of topics. And you can learn anywhere, anytime with the lynda.com app for Android. With the lynda.com subscription, members receive unlimited access to the entire course library. lynda.com works directly with software companies to provide timely training, often the same day new versions or releases hit the market, so you're always up to speed. Learn from top experts, and all of the courses are produced at the highest quality. Not like the homemade videos you'll find on YouTube. Whether you have 15 minutes or 15 hours, you can learn at your own pace on your own terms. It's only $25 a month for access to the entire lynda.com course library. Or for $37.50 a month, you can subscribe to the premium plan, which also includes exercise files. And you can try lynda.com right now with a free seven-day trial. Visit lynda.com slash arena to access the entire library. That's over 2,400 courses free for seven days. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash arena. So recently on episode 164 of All About Android, I brought the app AC Display into the arena on that show. And now I'd like to take a closer look because the app really does wield a lot of power. In fact, it's perfect for the person who doesn't have a Moto X yet wants to experience the convenience of one of that device's killer features active notifications. That's where the Moto X will briefly turn on the screen to show your current notifications, and it's a super neat feature, incredibly handy. Well, AC Display is one way that you can experience this kind of convenience on pretty much any Android device running 4.3 Jelly Bean or above. Launch the app and you'll see right away what a notification will look like. It's a slim and trim view of the current time, a row of your notification icons, and a dotted line that actually acts as a countdown to when the screen will turn off again. Tapping and holding any one of the notification icons will give you a brief preview box of what that notification entails. If a notification is actionable, that action is passed through to AC Display as well. If you tap on a notification icon and drag it up to the preview box, that will unlock your device and take you directly to that app. A great time saver. And if all you want to do is unlock your phone, simply tap and swipe on the dead space and you're in. You get some great customization options and settings as well. You can turn on active mode, which actually detects when you pull your device from your pocket or the table. And then it turns on the screen without you having to hit the power button. That's pretty cool. There's also lock screen mode with a beta warning. So do use at your own risk, but basically it enables AC display to be your always active lock screen replacement, which worked very well for me on my Nexus 5. For tweak heads, you can dial even deeper by determining things like how long AC display shows before turning the screen off, setting inactive hours where it doesn't run at all, uh, whether your wallpaper is used versus the default black background, and a few other visual tweaks. And finally, and this is a big one, there's a blacklist, so you can add apps that should not wake your display. AC Display has been easy on my battery and my daily usage of the app, and given the amount of settings that you're given, you have plenty of tools to tweak it up to your heart's content. AC Display is free, though there is a way to donate from inside the app, and the developer lets you know exactly what it goes toward. Ice cream, coffee, a new sound system. Hey, points for being honest. Now, as you may remember from last week, Hot to Trot is the time for me to show off pretty much anything that caught my eye from the past week. Could be a largely anticipated release that everyone is talking about. Could be a keyboard that does nothing but type the word Hodor. A few of you know what I'm talking about. That's your bag. You can get it for only 99 cents. But no, I'm not going <laughs> to do this segment talking about a single purpose keyboard. This week, I'm gonna take a look at a brand new strategic puzzle game that I can't stop playing. 
If ever there was a board game called Hitman Go, this would be an incredibly faithful digital recreation of it. And when you play it, you might even ask yourself if it is in fact the digital version of an actual board game thanks to the incredible attention to detail given to things like the player pieces and the play space boards. But in fact, it's not a recreation at all, just a well-designed, carefully crafted puzzle game with a total board game feel. The game is the latest in a series that dates back as far as the year 2000, and though the earlier releases in the Hitman series were actually third-person shooters, this game takes a completely different approach that is incredibly mobile-friendly. You are Agent 47, and your goal for each level is to move a number of spaces on the board without getting caught, ultimately reaching the target at the end of the level. Turn-based gameplay in this case means that you move one space and then the other pieces that share the board space with you are given their turn. If you can maneuver yourself to land on a space occupied by another piece, then you'll take them out. If you end up in front of them for their turn, they'll likely take you out. Some items on the board are immobile and come in very handy in your pursuit as well. For example, plants are great hiding places if you want one of the moving pieces to pass right by you. You can also pick up objects that can be thrown onto the board in strategic ways to break the movement pattern of other pieces. That'll send them in a different direction and hopefully open up a path for you to continue onward. The levels are carefully crafted and often there are more than a few ways that you can reach your target. In fact, at the end of each level, you are shown achievement cards that open up the replay value of the game even further. Cards like No Kill or Collect Briefcase send you on a different mission within the level and often change how you play in order to achieve the goal and hit the target. And speaking of the target, sometimes it's a simply a special space that moves you onward. Other times, it's actually the incredibly rewarding opportunity to assassinate a particular person of interest. And like I said, Square Enix Montreal really paid attention to little details that make this game a big success. The sound design is minimal and super engaging. The graphics walk a thin line between simplicity and intricate detail. And other splashes make it even more engaging, like when you take out a piece from play, you actually see that play piece sitting out of bounds as if you sat the piece on the floor in front of you while playing the board game. It's difficult enough to be challenging, but I rarely hit a level that I couldn't figure out after some head scratching and good old trial and error. Now, Hitman Go costs $4.99 in the Play Store, and while that may feel steep, there were no cut corners with this release, and I feel it was definitely worth the price. There are in-app purchases listed, but have no fear. They don't hinder your performance if you choose not to buy them. They basically allow you to instantly solve impassable levels, but then doing that would take the fun out of it. Don't you think? I hope you enjoy this puzzle game as much as I did. Seriously, I cannot put it down. All right, folks, that's it. You survived another episode of Android App Arena without getting picked off by Agent 47. Now, this show is meant to be a resource to you, but also it wouldn't happen without your input. So please share your tips and ideas for great apps to showcase by emailing me at arena at twit.tv. Also, there's our subreddit, at androidapparena.reddit.com. That's a place where you can add your favorite apps to particular categories that I'm working on featuring in an upcoming episode. Add your favorite, upvote ones that you agree with, uh, whatever you like. It'll really help me in knowing what apps you wish to see on the show. We have a Google Plus community that you can find easily by searching for Android App Arena over at Google Plus. You can always download or subscribe to the show by visiting twit.tv slash arena. Look for new episodes every Friday evening. And speaking of Fridays, you can be a part of the live component of this show by heading over to live.twit.tv every Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific. I'll be on hand to answer questions about the featured apps. And if we have a developer interview, it will take place right before your very eyes like magic. That's it, folks. Episode two of Android App Arena is done. I'm Jason Howell. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week in the arena.